Uh, if you've got your Bibles, open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. And we're going to be finishing up the uh, chapter 3 of Colossians today. So we're going to be reading five verses, beginning in verse 22 of Colossians 3. So Colossians 3, 22, beginning in 22, of course, says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance, says your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have, that you also have a master in heaven. Father, we thank you that through your sovereign power you preserved this beautiful epistle. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you that, Father, he was inspired to write this, and we pray this morning that as we listen to this, that we open our hearts to receive what you have to give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in the middle of the uh, Greater Than series, going through the book of Colossians. I absolutely love expositorily going through the book, any book of the Bible. We're going to be doing Joel very soon. We're really excited about that. The elders has been doing some, a lot of preparation on that. And we have heard four sermons now on Colossians chapter 3. So we've taken a lot of time. We're going to make up for that next week. We're going to have a whole sermon, one sermon for the whole Chapter 4, I think it is, so <laughs> we're going to make up ground there. But um, it's really interesting when we look at this that there's so much meat, there's so much truth in this one chapter, and it's really good. And so my purpose today, and it's really my prayer, that as we go through this passage of Scripture, we're going to see clearly how the principles taught by the Apostle Paul here about slaves and masters really apply to us whether we're employers or employees. And so that's my goal. So are you guys ready to jump into this? Yes. All right, well, let's, let's get going then. <laughs> wow, that is a pretty baby. Whose baby is that? <laughs> I have no idea. I just found it online. I mean, we've seen all these pretty babies. I thought I would just find one and put on there, just so you're all comfortable with that, so... He's cute, though. <laughs> I'm teasing. You know, one of the beautiful things that I love, I love to see how God is blessing this congregation with these beautiful children. And we had another one born this week. So I just wanted to throw up a random picture up there because I'm waiting for my second grandchild, so I might not have that for a while. So there you go. <laughs> all right. As one guy used to say, back to sobriety. So, all right. So you all know that context is king when you look at Scripture, right? And one of the really interesting things as we've gone through chapter 3 is the last three people that have preached have all gone back to the first three verses in Colossians. And there's a, the reason for that is because what Paul says for us to do can only happen genuinely if we've been transformed inside. And so I just want to quickly really go through that again, just quickly read through it, because we need to get a level set here. Because if we don't understand that this, this change has to happen inside, and then everything we're doing comes out of that, if we don't look at it that way, all we're going to be doing is behavior modification, and we don't want that. So Colossians 3, 1 through 3, let's just read that quickly. If then you have been raised with Christ, there's an assumption that he's making as he's preaching and writing, I should say, to the church in Colossae. He's saying, if you have been raised in Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. See, Paul sets up all the instructions he gives to the church with a basic understanding that those that are listening have been regenerated. If you don't have that perspective, all you're going to be doing is what I've called and lots of people called behavioral modification. It's important you understand this. 
Otherwise, you're just going to look at a list like this, and you're going to look at it as a bunch of to-dos. And that's not, we're, we do this out of what's changed inside. So let's now turn our attention to these last verses about bonds and slaves. Now, before we go any further, we need to have a basic understanding of what slavery was like and during the time of Christ, because it's really important. And a lot of you, I'm sure over your time in churches, you've heard lots of sermons on this. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But it's really important to understand that slavery during the time of Christ was a fact of life. In fact, in all societies, slavery was pretty much an accepted practice, really up until, frankly, pretty recently. It was accepted. Nations would come to war and go to war and take you know, captive other nations, and those people that became captives eventually became slaves. In fact, a lot of the soldiers from these defeated armies were, were made slaves to do heavy manual work. You think about how did Herod's temple get built? <laughs> you know, how did, I mean, a lot of these things were built by slaves. And a lot of them, by the way, were actually, of course, in the Roman era, they were actually turned, a lot of these soldiers were turned into gladiators. A lot of you know the, the movie Gladiator. Well, that really happened. That really true. Slaves were, were put into that service. And guess what? Their lifespan wasn't very long. Slaves didn't have a lot of hope, necessarily. But now there was a lot of slaves that were turned into household slaves, that they went and became slaves to people that were free, and they served in their household. And by the way, some of these slaves actually had a better life than even peasants, free peasants, because they had a roof over the head, they had food in their belly, they were provided for. And some peasants who were free didn't even have that. But let's just make no mistake, slavery still was a terrible thing. There was a tremendous amount of abuse. You could beat your slaves. There was a sexual abuse that happened often. Slavery was not a good thing. In fact, slaves could even be killed with very little consequences legally for the, for the, the master of the slave. It was terrible. But again, some slaves did lead pretty good lives. In fact, a lot of the professionals of the time were slaves. I mean, teachers, doctors, craftsmen, it's documented. A lot of these people were slaves. Because again, just like in Daniel's time when, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and took, you know, defeated the kingdom of Israel, Daniel's taken, and they, they chose these, the, the, the highly intelligent and educated members of the, uh, you know, the, of the Israel, and they, they became slaves, but they were used for things other than manual labor because they had intelligence. So literally, you could be an accountant and be a slave. In fact, most people are saying, well, I am an accountant, and it is a slave job. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that. But slaves could earn their freedom. Sometimes they were allowed to work on the side, and they could buy their freedom from a, a uh, their, their master, and sometimes their master can actually just grant them their freedom. And these people literally became known as free men. Free men. And of course, that's a common last name. I think Morgan Freeman, right? That name, Freeman, is a pretty common last name. Now, it's interesting to understand that this is not one lone passage of Scripture about slaves and, and masters. Uh, Paul literally addresses the same thing in the book of Ephesians when he wrote the church in Ephesus. In, in the, uh, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, this is what he says. And look at the similarities between what we just read. Bond servants obey earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not in the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. This was an important theme for Paul. He literally almost verbatim, says the same thing to the church in Ephesus as he did to the church in, in, uh, in Colossae. So this was important. 
Now, I just want to address something that's kind of the elephant in the room a lot of times when it comes to slavery in the Bible, and specifically how the apostles treated it. Some people, since we know slavery is wrong because of what we're, what we're taught through Scripture, some people say, why weren't the apostles more, well, let's say more adamant against slavery? Why were they not activists against slavery? Why weren't they walking around with picket signs in front of the pilot's house saying, down with slavery? Well, it's interesting that they really were against slavery. But they tackled slavery different than maybe we, we tackle inequalities today. You know how they did it? They did it by preaching the gospel. And when that gospel got into people's hearts, their hearts changed. You and I know it's just like what we're, we're obviously right now, abortion is, is, in the high, is in the, or right in front of us now with the Supreme Court deliberating this. We all know that you can stop abortion physically and legally, but it starts in the heart. You have to value that. You have to value human life in your heart. And it's really the same thing. They knew that once people grasped the gospel, once they were changed from the inside out, guess what happens? Their behaviors follow that. And so Christians who had slaves undoubtedly became very convicted that, wait a second, what are we doing? The culture accepts what we're doing, but are we really supposed to do that? And that's really the challenge. In fact, Paul is so adamant about it, he says this in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all, in, all one in Christ Jesus. Do you realize how incredibly radical this statement would have been to the church in Galatia? What did he say? <laughs> he says... There's neither Jew nor Greek. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's crazy. There is neither slave nor free. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? And then he says male nor female. <laughs> Wait a second. All of these were relationships that in the culture were very much not falling in line with what God wanted and what we knew to be right. And many Christians today kind of want to judge the apostles for not being more active against this, but the reality was they were attacking social issues by preaching the gospel and changing hearts. They were changing those inequalities one person at a time as the Holy Spirit worked in them. And by the way, you want more proof? Well, there's a book, an epistle, a very short one, named Philemon, depending on how you want to say that, in which basically Paul writes to a long-term and long-time member of the church about a runaway slave named Onesimus. And Paul writes, the whole purpose of this epistle is for Paul to tell Philemon, you need to treat Onesimus as a brother even though he ran away. And by the way, if you're a runaway slave, not good. Not good. But literally, he addresses this with Philemon by saying this. He's telling, he's telling Philemon about Onesimus. He said, no longer, mean treat him no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Now, that sounds kind of like an activist to me. And if you'll read that, it's really funny because Paul kind of drops, drops some veiled threats. <laughs> Even though he was in jail, by the way. But you got to ask the question, why was Onesimus there anyways? Why did Onesimus run away and run to Paul? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Because we need to remind ourselves who Paul was writing to in Colossae. You might say, Scott, that's easy. It's the church. In Colossae, it's the church. Okay. 
Well, let's talk about that. So where do churches meet, typically? In homes, right? They met in homes. Who would be in the homes? Family members. Oh, and slaves. Can you imagine Paul, the Apostle Paul coming to stay with you for three or four weeks? We're all like, I'll sign up for that. <laughs> The Apostle Paul and the other apostles would come to a, a church and they would stay with somebody for weeks, sometimes months. And the slaves would be there and the family would be there and they would be listening to Paul's teaching every night over lunch. And guess who was hearing that as well? The slaves. Brethren, many slaves came to Christ through hearing the gospel. And if we go back to Colossians 3, where I said he's writing to people who have been regenerated, and now he's redressing slaves, does it not make sense that he's talking to slaves that have been saved? So we have to keep that in our minds. It's not like he's writing to the, the church and to the church members, and he says, oh, by the way, I got a word for your slaves too. No, he's talking to slaves who had, been, had become Christians and that were saved. And it's so important to understand that because then it'll change your mindset about what he's about to say and the application to you. So what's the application today? Because after all, <clears throat> we don't have slavery. Although unfortunately, some people view their jobs as slavery <laughs> and you shouldn't. We're going to talk about that. I just want to encourage you, by the way, I don't want you to shut down on me because I'm about to step into an area that a lot of people, a lot of Christians, have a very clear dividing line. I mean, you might be looking at me saying, okay, Scott, I hear where you're going with this, and I don't like this. I work for a guy that's an absolute jerk. I don't respect him because he doesn't deserve my respect, so don't be telling me that I'm supposed to obey him like some slave back in the church in Colossae. You might be saying, you know, Scott, I appreciate the fact you got to give this sermon, but you're stepping over a line. My work life is over here. This is my Christian life. You can talk to me about my marriage. You can talk to me about raising my children like Tyler did last week. You can talk to me about all that stuff, but leave my work alone. That's over here. I've compartmentalized that. I hate to tell you this, but that's not the way Paul looked at it. If you are transformed, if you are regenerated, if you're truly saved, you're going to behave as somebody who's been transformed everywhere. Everywhere. You cannot compartmentalize your Christianity. You can't do it. You know, sometimes in business, I'll, uh, and I've, I, working in a the professional area. Of course, I've been working all my life, but I've been working with many people from different offices. I work remotely from my home. And there's times every once in a while I'll, I'll be at a conference or a, a meeting on site and we'll have time to kind of have social interactions or whatever. And, and someone will find out that I'm a Christian. And they will tell me, well, I'm a Christian too. And I go, whoa, Really? Uh, because nothing they ever said or did even gave me a hint of that. In fact, a lot of times it gave me the other impression. And let me just say this in case you think I'm being a real judgmental right now. That was me for many years. When God called me back, I gave him Sundays. I even gave him my family. I didn't give him my work. I didn't give him my work. And I had all kinds of excuses for that. Hey, I was in, I'm a professional, I'm in business. I can't let people know I'm a Christian because after all, they're going to walk all over me. I got to be cunning. I got to be smart. I got to work my way up the ladder. I got to do all these things. And I had a brother one time, brother in Christ, look at me and he said, do people know where you work? Do people at your work know you're a Christian? And I went, 
Nope. Then he said, why not? Man, you could have dropped an anvil on my head. It would have hit me less hard. It was really poignant. And it humbled me. If the people you work with don't know you're a Christian, maybe you've compartmentalized your faith like I had. And you need to repent of that. And by the way, I just want you to understand, in our process of sanctification, like mine was, as I came to Christ anew, out of, again, a cult basis, when I came to Christ anew, it was part of the sanctification process. Okay, so maybe that's what's going on in your life. But maybe you might be looking at me and going, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. You need to look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I, am I truly a believer? Because everything in my life should reflect that. It should reflect that. People you work with should know you're a Christian. Martin Luther says this, What you do in your house is worth as much as if you did it up in heaven for our Lord God. He obviously had read this, this passage of Scripture. We should accustom ourselves to think of our position and work as sacred and well-pleasing to God, not on account of the position and the work, but on account of the word and the faith from which the obedience and the work flow. What he's saying is, what's happened inside needs to flow out, and it should not be compartmentalized, should not be put in. Our work, brethren, where we work is sacred. Have you ever thought about that? Where you work is sacred. You've heard the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens at work stays at work. I can still come serve at the coffee bar. I can still come help with the youth. Yeah, it's not the way it works. You can't use that phrase if you're a Christian, because if you're a Christian, you are a Christian everywhere you go, or you may not be a true Christian at all. And that's hard, I'm, and I'm telling you, I had to come to that point too, and I had to look at myself and say, wait. And so I found myself, at first awkwardly, talking about my faith to my fellow believers. But you know what happened? Oh, some people ostracized me. Some people changed their view. I changed behaviors, so I wasn't the good time Charlie that drank too much and all that stuff and told the wrong kind of jokes. And I lost favor with some people. Do you know what happens? I also had opportunities to share with people that I never would have had before. It, was a, it became a wonderful opportunity. And it didn't mean I had to wear a cross. It didn't mean I had to end every meeting with, all right, everybody, go and be blessed. Amen. I didn't have to do that. But through how I behaved and acted and cared for them, that became big, a big influence on these people. So, with that as a background, let's talk about the instructions to the employees, because this applies. Let's look at what he says in verse 22. Let's break it down. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of your heart, fearing the Lord. Obey in everything? Did he really write that? Obey in everything? Well, obviously, and I loved what Tyler talked about last week, obviously, if your parents ask you to do something that is not right, you don't obey that. Same thing with work. And I've been in a professional client-facing job for many years, and there was a time one time that I was asked to lie to a customer. And I had to tell them, no, I can't do that. But I had to be wise as a serpent as well. And so I said, you know, why don't we just take it, this approach? And... I got the person I worked for to compromise, and we were able to still communicate honestly with the customer without lying to them. And that's tough, by the way, because I was able to work mine out, but there are times you might be told, you need to do this. You know what you gotta do? In cases like that, you have to say, who am I accountable to? This person, this job, or Jesus Christ? And those are hard decisions I understand. But the reality is, you have to stand true for what you know. So you don't have to obey in everything. How about obeying when we don't agree with a decision? Oh, this is a tough one. Yeah. Oh, this is a tough one. 
my boss just made the stupidest decision. We're going in this direction. It's the wrong direction. Everything in me knows it because I've been doing this for 25 years. They've been doing it for five. We've tried this before. It didn't work. Grumble, 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 grumble. Where's my manna? A principle somebody told me one time was that if you don't believe in a decision that your boss is making, do everything in your power to make it succeed. Because if it doesn't succeed, you can go, nah, 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 nah. no, no, no. <laughs> because if it doesn't succeed and it doesn't show that it was the right decision, you've did everything you can to make it succeed. And your boss will look upon you with great respect when you do that. Don't run to somebody else and complain about it. And by the way, I just want to make sure that you're, you're understanding here. I fail on a lot of these things, and this sermon convicted the heck out of me. I got a lot of, lot of, lot of changes I have to make. So this is a real convicting sermon for me, and I hope it is for you too. Because I have to realize that, and by the way, sometimes we can sit back and criticize the decisions that are made by people above us, but we might not have all the information. In fact, let me just say, we don't have all the information they do. Okay? So the principle is we should obey. They're paying us. They're compensating us for this. And we're going to bring glory to God through that obedience. He then goes on, he says, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Now the connotation here is, is not obeying for self-service. Now, this will really stand in opposition and contrast to what most people, how they look at their jobs. Eye service means working hard only when you're, you're being watched. That's what he's really talking about there. And then when they're not looking, you slack off. So you're a great employee when you're being watched, but when you're not, see ya. I'm going to do what I want to do now. I want to slack off. I had an experience one time... <laughs> Uh, when I was a kid, I was 17, I think, 18, young man. I was asked, I, I was hired out to do some work for a guy I never knew. He, was, he had footers that he was digging for a house. And I got there, there was about 10 feet of this footer that was dug, and he said, I need you to dig the rest of the footer. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning or something. I said, okay. He said, I got to go. I'll come back in a few hours, see how you're doing. So my dad had taught me that when the boss isn't there, you work extra hard. So I give my dad the credit for this. So I just started working. I wasn't killing myself. I, he ta also taught me to pace myself. So I'm working away. I'm digging this footer. The boss comes back about two, three hours later. He gets to the truck. He walks over and he goes, whoa. And I stopped. I thought, I did something wrong. I thought I dug the wrong thing. I said, is there everything right? He goes, you've dug like 20 feet. And I've, I've been gone for just a couple hours. I said, yeah, I'm trying to work hard. <laughs> he said, that first 10 feet, he said, I had a kid here yesterday digging for seven hours. That's all he got accomplished. And I looked at him and I literally wanted to say, did he only have one arm? Because <laughs> I wasn't killing myself, but I was working hard. My dad taught me to do that. Well, unfortunately, you realize one of the reasons people don't like people working from home is because they feel they're probably not working hard enough. i got to watch over them. But we really should be the people that work harder when we're not being watched. And the second part where he says people pleasers, that's when we want to get recognition from the right people. And one thing I can tell you that I've learned, because I've had a wrong approach to this before in my life, but one of the things I've learned is if you do your job with excellence, and you do it with excellence, whether it's somebody from the help desk calling you up for help, or whether it's the boss's boss calling you for some information, you serve them all with the same passion and integrity. And you know what will happen? You'll be recognized, and you'll be rewarded, but that's not why you do it. It's just a byproduct of you working like you're serving and, and working for the Lord. He also says, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. The sincerity of the heart, you know, if he hadn't put that in there, you could go back to, oh, this is behavior modification. But he literally says, with sincerity of the heart. 
If you walk away from this sermon and say, I'm going to do all these things Scott says to do, but you're only doing it because you want to look better to your boss, and there's, you're really not convicted in your heart, then you're not obeying what he's saying. You're not doing what he's saying. The sincerity of the heart is what's the most important. Because that's what drives your behaviors in everything. He says with sincerity of the heart. You should sincerely want to do these things because of the fact that they've been, you have, and I have been regenerated with Christ. It's part of who we are. And that means, by the way, breaking some old beliefs. The other thing, of course, is fearing the Lord. A lot of us don't fear the Lord like we should. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Work as you are working for the Lord. And you notice he says it twice, knowing that from the Lord you will receive that inheritance. He says you are serving the Lord Christ. And then he says, as for the Lord... Literally twice, he's saying, you're working for the Lord when you are working for and you put in your company name. Can you imagine if tomorrow morning you got up and you knew you were going to be going to your job site where Jesus was your boss? Would you be late? I don't think so. But that's literally what he's saying. I don't know how else to interpret this. That's what he's saying. We need to ask ourselves some questions. And I've, I've just listed some things down here for you to think about. Do we arrive on time and leave at the correct time? If we're hourly, do we record our time honestly and correctly? Do we work hard and diligently while we're at work? Do we finish our projects in a timely manner? Do we perform our jobs with excellence? And because of time, I'm not going to go through every one of these. But I hope you get the understanding of this. If you are working for Christ, everything will line up. And suddenly your perspectives can be really different. Verse 25, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. This payback obviously was talking from a high level about our reward that comes when we are face to face with Jesus. Because we will be judged based upon our performance of what we've done with the gifts God's given us. And this no partiality, by the way, he's speaking directly to slaves here. You might say, what's this talking about? Well, again, the parallel passage in, in Ephesians 6, 9 is really important because he's going to be admonishing masters as well but he, on this partiality. But one commentator states this, he says, Paul meant this as a warning to Christian slaves not to presume on their position before God, meaning they're Christians before God, to think that he, Jesus, would overlook their misdeeds even if they were acting uh, unscrupulously because of being treated unfairly. Brethren, we have, a, we have this justice thing in our head. You treat me that way, well, watch out. You're going to pay the price. Now, I might do it passively by undermining your authority to other people, by speaking bad about you to other employees, but treat me bad and I'm going to get you back. Paul's saying that they're going to have accountability for that. Brethren, I don't know if you're like me, but I have worked before for people that were not really nice, that didn't have my back. I've been thrown under a few buses in my career and felt the wheels go over me. And I wish I could say every time I didn't fight back and I didn't pay evil for evil. Sometimes I did. But as time went on, I realized, wait a second, I, I don't have to justify and stand up for myself. Christ has my back. He's the one that's going to bring resolution to these things. And guess what he has? He has. Just because you're treated badly doesn't give you the right, or me the right, to respond in kind, to pay evil for evil. 
It's easy to justify our behaviors based upon stuff like that, but it's not right. Now, last few minutes, I'm going to talk about employers and managers. Okay? Because Colossians 4, 1, and I have no idea why the people that divided the Bible up into chapters didn't just put 4, 1, Colossians 4, chapter 4, verse 1, at the end of chapter 3, because it's really where it belongs. God's sovereign, it's there for a reason, but we're going to move that. So next week, you're going to, the passage will start on <laughs> chapter 4, verse 2. <laughs> so I'm going to steal verse 1. He says, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So the focus now shifts to the masters, and he only says this one, it's just this one verse. But if you're a boss or you're a supervisor, don't get too comfortable because in Ephesians 6, it's a long verse about this. In Ephesians 6, verse 9, he says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. I love that. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no partiality with him, meaning Jesus. Paul gives them the motivation for treating their servants justly, and fairly, because they say, you're both answered to the same master. Remember, these slaves were undoubtedly Christians. We answer the same. If you supervise people or if you have your own business and employ people, you must understand that you are accountable to Jesus Christ himself for how you treat them. Simple as that. And I put a whole list of stuff up here again. We won't because of time go through. But do you treat your employees with dignity and respect? Do you play favorites? Or do you try to be objective and treat everybody fairly? Do you pay your employees fairly and on time? Do you set reasonable expectations for their employees for the jobs they're doing? Do you provide them the right tools and the right equipment? Do you treat them fairly with grace when they mess up? I have seen people at church, they were the most wonderful people, and you're like, man, I would go to work for that person in a heartbeat. And then you see them in a work environment, and you go, oh my goodness. And I will tell you, those are the kinds of people that will tell you, here's church, here's work. Because you got to do this. Rather, no, you don't. I worked for people that were wonderful bosses, that loved the Lord, and you saw it in how they treated people with respect. If you own a company or you, you manage people, you're accountable for treating them justly and fairly. So I'm going to conclude quickly by saying this. There are a 168 hours in a week. If you want to get your calculator out, you can test my math. I was a soft science major, by the way, so... If we sleep an average of seven hours a night, that equals 49 hours of sleeping. So if we take that away from 168, that leaves 119 hours where we are conscience, conscious. The average American between ages of 24 and 54 works about 40 hours a week. Literally, it literally comes to 40 hours. Some work a lot more. And if my math stands up, and I did it twice, that means a third of our conscious hours every week are spent working. Do you realize the opportunity we have to witness to people about the change that's happened inside? Do you realize that? A third of our time, we have the opportunity to show Christ to people, to shine the light. Recently, a person was leaving our company, and I'd known them for about four or five years. And they called me personally. We have teams where you can call and talk. Chad and I work together, by the way. I, I threatened Chad. I had a bunch of bad examples of I was going to use, to, but I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it, Chad. Chad, by the way, sets a wonderful example at our, at our company. He's, he's wonderful. But this person called me on team so you can see them. We have cameras and we were talking. And she was just expressing how she appreciated, you know, our time together and working together. 
And I said, well, we're really going to miss you. And then I stopped and I said, would you mind if I prayed for you? Wow. She looked at me and she said, yes, I would love that. And I just prayed God's blessing on her. And when I opened my eyes, she was crying. And she said, thank you. And I thought, how wonderful would it have been for people to have prayed over me in different times. And did I take a little bit of a gamble? Yeah. But you know what? She responded so beautifully to that. Have I missed a lot of other opportunities to pray for people? Yeah. Brethren, you can bring the gospel to your work. Whether you're an employer or an employee, you can bring the gospel to your work And in fact, you're really commanded to. And so I really hope and pray that this passage of Scripture in Colossians convicted you like it did me, by the way, to truly view every hour and every minute that you spend at work as an opportunity to share the gospel and to share what has happened inside of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture that sometimes we can just glean over quickly, read over quickly, and say, oh, that's for slaves. It's for us, Lord. Thank you for preserving it both here in Colossians and in Ephesians. And Father, I pray that each one of us would be convicted, and tomorrow morning when we get up and go to work, or if we're working tonight, that we literally get on our knees and thank you for the jobs you've given us. Thank you, Lord. And that you... Help us to realize that everything we do, we're going to be working for you, first and foremost. I pray blessings on all of us that way, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.